Hello. Hi everyone, welcome to our first joint webinar of the year. Thank you so much everyone for joining. It's great to see so many faces. Well, you know, it's great to see so many blocks on the <laughs> screen. <laughs> Before we get started, can we just do a little bit of housekeeping today? Um, on entry, if you could make sure your cameras are off and you're securely on mute. Um, we have tried to do this automatically, um, but sometimes the cameras come on. It's not because we don't want to see your beautiful faces, but it's because it helps make the, um, the network more secure and it makes sure our connection is stable. Um, if you could also switch to speaker view so that, um, so I think it's at the top of the screen, if you just click speaker view so that you can see whoever is speaking um, at the moment, it'll make it a better experience for you. Um, and if you notice at the bottom of the screen in the chat box, you can send messages directly to people. So for any questions, um, could you please send them directly to the Q&A moderator, who, who is Polly Wynn, who will send them through to me and Emma so that we can ask the panel your questions during the Q&A. We also need to make you aware that we'll be recording this session and it will be shared on the PAC website and through our Grayling channels. And please also feel free to tweet as we go along. Feel free to tag Public Affairs Cymru and Grayling in Wales so you can get a cheeky retweet as well as a hashtag <laughs> introduction to Welsh Parliament. Um, so now that, that that bit is over, we've no fire alarms scheduled in my house today. <laughs> but who knows? Um, so I'm Gwyneth and I'm the Chair of Public Affairs Cymru in Wales, which is a fantastic membership-based organisation which represents public affairs professionals working in Wales. I'm also an account manager at Grayling in Wales, helping clients with strategic public affairs and comms. We're really proud to be presenting this webinar on behalf of both PAC and Grayling, allowing us to offer, everyone and offer it to everyone and attract the fantastic panel that we have. Today, we're going to be talking about a really big change that happened in Wales last week. Legislation that has been much debated, discussed and celebrated over the last few months. On the 6th of May in 2020, we officially went from having a National Assembly for Wales to having a Welsh Parliament. Um, so today we're going to be discussing what's in a name. That's what we're going to be talking about and we're going to be talking about kind of all that it means which are, with our brilliant panel. A new name for our decision-making body in Wales is this going to show the world what we're truly made of and allow wider recognition of the work the Senate does. With the new legislation, it's obviously it's not just the name that has changed. There's other big changes that have come into effect as well. Our next Welsh Parliament elections will see 16 and 17 year olds and eligible foreign nationals voting for the first time. We perhaps had our predictions on how this would affect the outcome of those elections, but in a world hopefully post COVID-19 by then, um, we might find new and surprising trends. So we've got an incredible lineup of speakers today to talk this through with us, and I'm gonna run through them all now. First, we've got the incredible Dawn Bowden, now a member of the Senate instead of an assembly member and chair of the Electoral Reform Committee. She's represented her constituency brilliantly since 2016 with a really strong passion for job creation after a long family history within the trade union movement. We'll hear about her time chairing the committee as well as her personal experience and passion on this topic. Her contributions cannot be underestimated. And so it's a real honor to be able to hear straight from her. Then we're going to hear from Professor Roger Owen Scully, everyone's favorite temperature tester and predictor <laughs> of elections. He just published a new blog today, I've seen, so I'm sure everyone will run to read that once this is over. He's also head of the Wales Governance Centre in Cardiff University and a key commentator. We've also got um, Professor Laura McAllister, who's played such an important role in this change, as chair of the expert panel on assembly reform. She's going to be joining us in a bit. She's also a professor of public policy and and the governance of Wales at the Wales Governance Centre. We're also going to hear from Ethan Williams, who is president of the Earth, which aims to provide opportunities through the medium of Welsh for children and young people in Wales to become fully rounded individuals, developing personal and social skills, allowing them to make a positive contribution to the community. We'll be hearing from him what the change would mean for young people in Wales. And at last, finally, but certainly not least, we'll hear from the president of Cardiff Student Union, Jackie Yip, on what she thinks the vote and name change means for engaging a younger generation in politics. And what does this mean for university students who will have been able to vote before they come to university? Once we've heard from our panel members, we'll move to Q&A round, where we'll, we'll, we'll be accepting um, questions in the chat, um, but also asking some of our own. 
as our fantastic speakers give their piece, please feel free to leave your questions in, this, in the chat. Please um, send them to Polly at Q&A Moderator. If you just go on the chat box, you should be able to see that. And Emma Henwood, our brilliant Vice Chair of Public Affairs Cymru, and I will read them out to the panel and get a good discussion going. So we're going to start now um, first with our Member of the Senate, Dawn Bowden, to give her contribution. Uh, and thank you very much to Public Affairs Cymru for uh, inviting me to to take part in, in this event. And I, I, you know, I'm really looking forward actually to hearing what some of the other colleagues have got to say, and in particular what some of the the, the, con the contributors and and questions uh, around this are, are going to be. But for me, I guess. I'm pleased that the Senate took the opportunity to mark and celebrate 20 years of devolution last year, because at the moment, this change to becoming the Senate and officially for people like me becoming uh, members of the Senate feels like something of a footnote <laughs> in a chapter entitled Coronavirus, Other Things That Happened. But I, I feel approaching this that my brain looks at this in, in two parts. First part, it thinks, why did we spend so much time fussing over a title? It now seems such an unimportant thing, and, and it was actually quite a long time ago. But the second part of my brain recognises that introducing the term Senez, Parliament, is an important recognition of what's happened in Wales in just over 20 years of devolution. I think in a small way, it probably helps to improve the symmetry around the perceptions of democracy within the UK. And it also brings us back to those early words about devolution being a process and not an event. So I come to this event as the chair of the Committee on Senedd Electoral Reform, which was established by the Welsh Assembly to look at how we could move forward from the expert panel report, Creating a Parliament uh, That Works for Wales, which was chaired by Laura McAllister, and I've no doubt she's going to be uh, talking about that a bit later on. And while I don't want to spend a lot of time talking uh, at this point about the dry work of the committee, I think it's important to know that we've been looking at some critical elements of how Wales should be governed in the future, including the size of the parliament, the electoral systems and boundaries that we use, and how we can make it a more diverse and inclusive institution. And I know from this work that while many are eager for even more change, others remain sceptical about change and even sceptical skeptical about devolution itself. So how can we best frame what is happening? Well, I often try and think about all those younger people in Wales, certainly obviously younger than me, and, and it'll be interesting to hear from them uh, later, who in fact have never known a Wales without devolution. And I suppose for my generation, we can make comparisons between the days of Wales having uh, just having a Secretary of State and a couple of ministers, and the situation that we now have with a Welsh government and a Senedd. We can compare John Redwood nodding along to the national anthem to a first minister greeting the national rugby team on the steps of the Senedd. It's been quite a journey. And as a current member of the Senedd, I recognise that part of my responsibility is to help shape a Senedd and a parliament that is best suited to the aspirations of those that follow me. Secondly, we have to think about the world that the Senedd now faces. And once again, I look at this in two parts. First, there is the aspirational part. I see it on social media and in the worthy blog pieces, a world to be transformed by the culture shock of COVID-19, a kinder, more sharing world, turning our roads into cycle tracks and everyone growing vegetables for their neighbors. But the second part is perhaps more realistic families and communities grieving, a physically and emotionally drained workforce, greater numbers unemployed and an underemployed workforce, higher levels of poverty, increasing inequality, skills deficiencies in key sectors, a backlog of ill health and related conditions, homeless people needing shelter and personal and state debt and in the short term a fear of a second wave of coronavirus hitting us and at the moment in my mind realism is actually winning over aspiration. However, 
to finish on a more positive note, because I mean, let's face it, there's, a bit of a, there's enough gloom around at the moment. It's, it's now about two years, I think, since I wrote a blog piece published um, discussing what I called um, a well-being state of, of Wales. It was framed to think about the types of outcomes we, we might want to see in Wales rather than just deba debating inputs and outputs. And it perhaps feels even more relevant today than it did uh, two years ago. Perhaps it can be my positive contribution to the debate as our Senate now moves towards discussing a post-COVID future. A post-COVID future that my committee had never anticipated when it started its work and which ironically, because of the current crisis, may well not fully complete its work. A post-COVID world that will not be the same for many years to come and which will present challenges to the Welsh Parliament that it had never even thought about. To say the future is uncertain has never been more true, but with a Welsh Parliament supported by the Welsh people, there is every reason to be confident that the challenges presented to us can be met. Um, I, before we move to Roger, I just want to apologise for getting your title wrong. Um, it's actually part of the UK Political Studies Association. Um, so, Professor, would you um, like to give your contributions? Uh, thanks very much, Gwyneth. Um, and it's appropriate in a way that I follow on from Dawn, because I, as, uh, as the COVID crisis was getting serious, uh, the very last public thing that I did was... Uh, <laughs> To appear before Dawn's committee, uh, and then the university was more or less shut down the following day. So, um, I mean, clearly, at the moment, you know, COVID um, and how it has been dealt with is is dominating the news and governmental agenda. Um, part of that discussion, of course, has been about uh, the relations on, on these islands between the different governments here. And I think, you know, to to an extent, there's maybe surprised quite a lot of us the evolution. Um, it, its facts and its implications have been brought to the fore um, because of this you know, very major um, crisis in an area which is a core devolved competence um, in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Um, I, I think you maybe in the Q&A can, can consider some of the um, implications of that, particularly some of the um, frankly, a denigration of the role of devolved governments that's been emanating both from the media and at times from politicians in London. Um, but to stick more to what I was asked to talk about, um, the name change uh, of, you know, formerly the National Assembly for Wales, now Senate can be the Welsh Parliament. Um, how important is that and will that be? And in some senses it is, as Dawn indicated, merely really um, the terminology catching up with reality. There's been this very substantial constitu constitutional journey in Wales over the last two decades. And the name of the institution now, I might argue, more accurately reflects what has been for many years now, uh, a lawmaking parliament uh, based in Cardiff Bay. Now that distinction between the assembly and the parliament is, is something that, um, has existed in at least part of Brit British political discourse for, for many years. There is this sense that an assembly is something that is in some not particularly clearly defined way less than a parliament, somehow a, a less proper institution. Um, it was notable that for much of her time uh, as Prime Minister, for instance, Margaret Thatcher refused to refer to the European Parliament as the European Parliament, but still referred to it as the assembly in Brussels. Um, so this idea that somehow an assembly is, is, is a lesser institution, um, that's a rather bizarre distinction given that many major national lawmaking parliaments around the world are called things like a national assembly, like that in France for instance, but nonetheless the distinction does exist in Wales, oh, sorry, in, in, in British political discourse. Now in Wales, moving to the new name, um, what implications will that have? Well I think that may help at least a little bit in terms of perceptions of the importance of, of the institution. Um, it may help in at least some quarters for public perceptions to catch up with the reality of this being you know, a substantially important lawmaking parliament. Um, because also people are more used to the terminology of parliament and understanding 
in some rough sense, the distinction between that and government, um, the name change may also help a little bit, at least, in clarifying the executive legislative distinction at the default level, uh, just as it is broadly understood, um, say, at the UK level. Um, exactly the extent to which this will help is, I think, something that has been and is going to continue to be fairly difficult to research, precisely. Um, I've been spending some time recently trying to think of subtle or in, indirect uh, survey questions that we may be able to ask to see to what extent the use of this, this terminology may change public perceptions of, of the importance of the devolved level legislature. Um, but you know, that, that's kind of something uh, that, will, that will need to continue to be, to be researched. Alongside the name change, the same piece of legislation, of course, also changed the voting age for devolved level elections in Wales. Um, the same change that was implemented a few years ago in Scotland is now in place in Wales. And so 16 and 17 year olds, or people who are, will be 16 and 17 uh, by the first Thursday in May next year, um, will have the chance to vote for uh, devolved level elections at least. Um, they still won't be eligible to vote in a general election uh, or for the moment in local government elections, but um, they will have the opportunity to vote. The partisan implications of the change in the franchise is something that I've been asked about numerous times already. In fact, if I had a pound for every time I've been asked about which party is this going to help, how much difference is this going to make, um, while retirement would not be an immediate financial option, I could certainly buy several very nice meals. Um, frankly, actually, the partisan implications are going to be pretty, pretty tiny and minor. Um, there just aren't enough 16 and 17 year olds, even if they turned out in very large proportions, there just aren't enough of them to make a substantial difference to the election outcome next year. In the January Welsh Political Barometer, we, um, we investigated this. We did our standard sample of um, respondents 18 and above, and we also then um, expanded our sample to include a proportionate number of 16 and 17 year olds. When you compare the voting intention figures um, using the two different ways of drawing the sample, basically it puts the Conservatives down one percentage point and Labour up one percentage point. I mean, that's the sort of um, degree of change that uh, voting um, franchise reforms can potentially make. And even that is assuming that we see a continuance of the very stark um, age differentials in voting preferences that we've seen in the UK in recent years. Um, if those age differentials start to narrow, then 16, 17 year olds will make even less of a difference. So it's unlikely that the partisan implications are going to change more than one or two seats in the next um, election to what's now the Welsh Parliament. What may be more interesting is the implications of this for, for young people. Um, those who are still at school, who um, are potentially going to get the right to vote, uh, to be a more full part of the political process, um, how it immediately, if it does change the extent to which they develop an interest in politics, uh, get involved in politics, whether getting the vote at that slightly younger age may make them a little bit more inclined as the longer term to be politically engaged and interested. And the expert panel that my colleague Laura McAllister chaired um, spent a lot of time looking at evidence on this and thinking about this before they recommended the extension of the franchise. The third and final issue I was asked to talk about today is um, the issue that uh, Dawn's committee has been spending a lot of time looking at. So following up on the first piece of legislation, the possibility of further legislation that could uh, increase the size of the Welsh Parliament. Um, and if you increase the size of the Welsh Parliament, you have to do something to the electoral system, the system by which that institution is elected. Um, apparently, voting to increase the number of politicians is something that is never going to be popular. And in various surveys, I've, you know, I've tried writing survey questions in, in a number of different ways to see if you could find a question formulation that appeared to make this a popular thing to do and basically concluded that you can't um, unless you told people that somehow increasing the number of members of the devolved parliament would 
abolish poverty or abolish illness or something like that. Um, basically, voting for more politicians is never going to be popular. And perhaps particularly at a moment of public policy crisis is particularly likely to be unpopular. Um, so if it's something that's going to happen, it's going to happen because politicians believe fundamentally it's the right thing to do and are maybe willing to take a little bit of short term public stick in, in return for delivering something they think is fundamentally good. But the obstacle always with, with doing that change is not so much the vote on the principle of, of, of a larger devolved parliament, which in private, um, all politicians from every party in that institution I've spoken to, including the Conservatives and including those who were elected in 19, 2016 for UKIP, all of them agree that's a good thing. But how do you get there? Um, how do you get them, particularly by adjusting the electoral system? And that, I think, is the politically difficult bit. Um, and would be politically difficult um, no matter which parties were the largest parties in the devolved chamber. Um, we have under the legislation a two-thirds threshold uh, for reforms of the electoral system. That's entirely appropriate to prevent a party, maybe in a temporary narrow majority, trying to stitch up the electoral system for themselves. Changes to the rules of the game should be matters of broad consensus. But it's also the case that people who have already been elected to an institution under one, electoral, under one electoral system are pretty much by definition beneficiaries of that system. And to get change, you'll need to get a super majority of them to vote for another system. That is always going to be an innately very difficult thing to do. Um, and I think at the moment it's, it's difficult to see much political attention and focus being delivered to that. So whether it is before next year's scheduled election or after, um, I think mobilizing the required majority to vote for change um, is still going to be a very difficult thing to do, a very difficult thing to deliver politically. Thank you for that, Roger. That was, that was brilliant. Um, we're going to move on. We're going to circle back on everything everyone's been saying in the Q&A section. Um, we're going to move on now to um, Professor Laura McAllister um, for her contribution. Um, I'm not sure, Laura, if you saw earlier, um, but I kind of described a little bit about your history and the important um, role that you played in this change as chair of the Expert Panel on Assembly Reform um, Committee. Great. Well, uh, Pranonda, everybody, thank you very much indeed, Gwyneth. Apologies for joining the uh, discussion late. I was actually doing a Zoom interview with Adam Price, who you all know is leader of Plaid, which is uh, an interview that will appear in Planet magazine this summer. Anyway, that went on slightly longer as we were chatting about a whole range of things, as you can imagine. So, so my sincere apologies. Uh, really pleased to be here and lovely to see Dawn and, and Roger and various other people who've been involved and Jackie for that matter and Ethan and everybody else who've been involved in some of these really important um, debates. I'm trying to think what I can say that can add real value to the conversation. I guess I can tell you a little bit about my thinking now having chaired the expert panel and, um, around what's happened subsequently. Um, I, I suppose my, my reflections are a mix of disappointment and pride that we've had some progress certainly. The, the inclusion or in the Senate and Election Wales Bill of votes for 16 and 17 year olds was a very significant recommendation of the panel and I'm delighted that that's come to force although I think we've got some way to go to ensure that the requisite political education and citizenship preparation if you like is integrated into the curriculum and indeed in extracurricular environments to make sure that the next generations of young people are properly equipped to be able to um, exercise that exciting new uh, involvement in the franchise but as I said at the time you know if anyone thinks that 16 and 17 year olds are more ignorant or less equipped then they only need to go out and talk to some 67 year olds and 68 year olds to find that ignorance and lack of education about politics is prevalent pretty much in every age group in society and I, I never bought for a moment that young people were less well informed or less motivated to vote than any other age group and actually one of the reasons, the strongest reason, in my opinion, for including younger people in the franchise was that this gave us an opportunity to actually get right our political education for another generation. Because there is an argument, some of my fellow academics make it, and I've challenged them on it, by the way, that 
in effect, you could pick up a group of 40 to 50 year olds and educate them better around politics. But my argument is always we don't have the opportunity to do that, whereas we do with young people in education. And if we can start this really young and I mean, I, I you know, a lot of European countries started in primary education, you know, around year, year five and year six. And, I, you know, that's for another day. But I think if we can get young people properly um, uh, au fait with politics in the general sense, with elections in the general sense, and then encourage them to be critical thinkers about politics as well. You know, for me, citizenship education is not about telling them how you go to a polling station and cast your vote, although that's important. It's to get them to be able to critically evaluate party manifestos, to challenge politicians and scrutinize those of us in public life who talk about this, and to get to the kind of nub of the issue so that we're all more confident voters when it comes to casting our vote. So I think, you know, for me, that was probably the, the biggest argument in favour of including young people in the franchise. In terms of the name change, I, I, I'm not terribly passionate about that, if I'm being really honest. Um, I think it's a good reflection of where the Senate is now, and it probably better, ac better accurately reflects uh, the status and the powers and the international um, context and positioning of the uh, institution. As Roger said, you know, the term assembly is less widely understood um, outside mainland Europe um, and therefore is seen to have a slightly lesser status. But lots of people will remember the arguments of, of David Ellis Thomas um, in the in the run up to the establishment of the uh, uh, National Assembly, when he argued very strongly that this located Wales in that European model of assembly. So, you know, you can have that both ways, but I think it's important and we should celebrate the fact that we now have a parliament called a parliament for the first time since the 15th century and the parliaments that existed in Harlech and um, Machantleth. So I suppose that's a cause for some celebration. I guess my disappointment comes, and Dawn knows this only too well because I've expressed it in evidence to her committee, that, that we are where we are in terms of the rest of our expert panel report. Um, and I, I think that shows a degree of um, lack of self-confidence amongst assembly, sorry, set, I should say MSs now themselves, because, you know, nothing is better than being given an opportunity um, by an independent panel that clearly has no political capital or any political involvement that sets out a blueprint for making that institution more workable. And I think that's what we did really by talking about enlarging the assembly to between 80 and ideally 90 members. We, we mapped out a different way of electing those members and some potential boundaries that could deliver that size assembly. And of course, the Assembly Commission and the Llywydd could have run with that legislation in the same way that they did with the Senate and Election Wales bills, Bill, which would have taken the sting out of it for um, the political parties and certainly for the Welsh Government, uh, had there been a consensus on moving forward. So, so I, I struggle with understanding why that wasn't a more attractive option uh, for the simple reason that I think this is going to have to be addressed at some point soon. Um, it, there's no doubt in my mind and having been involved with some quite forensic analysis of where the assembly uh, where the assembly shortfalls are that we have a pretty scattergun approach to scrutiny in the assembly simply because of capacity well not simply but mostly because of capacity um, we have really essential weaknesses in terms of robust scrutiny of all of the public bodies that are external to the assembly and the way that public finances are spent and i think over time that has actually lost us a lot of money. So in, you know, to counter the point that Roger made very fairly that nobody's in, ever in favor, of, in favor of any greater spend on politics, the biggest argument that I think our report set out was that actually having more politicians, if, if the assembly were to then operate better, the Senate were to operate better and more strongly, could actually save money rather than cost money. I think that's a very, very strong argument that needs articulating by all of the parties when I hope, by the way, they include something on enlarging the size in their manifestos for the Senate elections in a year's time. And quite frankly, if the parties don't include a commitment to enlarging the Senate in their manifestos, then they are essentially saying that they are prepared to work with at least one of their hands tied behind their backs for another assembly term. And, and nobody can make the parties include this in their manifestos, but if they don't, then I think it will be 
sending a pretty clear signal to everybody out there that there are parties that are quite comfortable with working with a pretty shoddy model of devolution that really is no longer fit for purpose and can marry the responsibilities that we have and the competencies we have with a proper commitment to effective scrutiny. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much, Professor. That was that was really brilliant. We'll circle back um, again in the Q and A session um, and make sure we get some really good questions for you. That was really brilliant. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to um, Ethan Williams, President of the Earth. Oh, shmai, pnanda, jachwinef, jachwinef. I'm coming over. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's just nice to be able to to talk to some people during a complete time of isolation. So it's uh, uh, really great to be here. Um, as Gwena said, uh, my name is Ethan, I'm president of Eirithgobad um, Cymru, which is Wales' largest youth organisation. Um, and as Gwena said at the start, we um, have the absolute privilege of providing um, youth activities from sport competitions, or usually we have the opportunity to provide these um, activities, things like sport, music, culture, um, all through the medium of Welsh. Um, and my role is to uh, kind of represent uh, our members. We've got just under 56,000 represent those members within the organisation to make sure that the members are at the heart of what we do. Um, but I also have the privilege of doing events like this um, and being able to represent the voices of, of our members um, with government officials and on panels like this. Um, and all I can say with regards to um, changing the voting age is that I am so, so proud to be Welsh and so, so proud of the Welsh Parliament having seen um, that the change came in. Um, it's something I have been kind of campaigning for for, for a while. Um, actually, when I started campaigning for it, had they brought in the legislation then, I would have been one of the people who had benefited from a vote. Uh, but in the last few weeks of lockdown, I've actually reached the nice round age of 20, which I think shows just how long um, I have been waiting for it. Um, but yeah, it makes me so, so proud to be Welsh that um, young people are, um, well, having their voices heard through, this is something that has come from young people that they, they said they want, but now through this, we'll be able to, to have their voices heard. Um, and my kind of argument from the start has always been, well, if you look at um, what, um, legally 16 and 70 year olds are allowed to do. They are allowed to um, join the military, they're allowed to get married, they're allowed to start a family. And the key thing um, as well, they're also allowed to do or not allowed to have to do when they start earning money is pay tax as 16 year olds start getting national insurance numbers and can work. Um, they are then kind of under an obligation to, um, to pay tax, assuming of course that they um, are in the threshold. So my argument has always been, well, if that person is con potentially contributing towards um, towards their country, why should they not have the same say um, in how their country is governed and effectively what their, what their taxes are paid on, uh, uh, go towards um, the services that uh, they provide, of course. Um, and I think it is such an amazing change, and, um, but there are, as kind of um, Laura and Roger kind of touched on, is the things that, that come with that, things that we have to implement, more changes that we have to look at um, to ensure that it's not just... Um, a token in a sense that we're not just saying oh 16 and 17 olds can go and um, do this but they actually get um, the policies that they see that they, they want implemented that they are implemented. Um, as part of my role I work with um, a group of young people from across Wales and we form a board called Bursary Bank uh, which effectively is a collection of young people from across Wales and we get together uh, we do I think about four meetings a year usually normally one in North Wales one in South one in Mid Wales um, but now I think we're going to try and do them all over Zoom and we get together and we, we discuss key political issues and we, we talk about things that we want to see implemented, especially in Wales. Um, and we actually have the privilege of working with a lot of uh, Senate members um, in, in doing that. Um, so these kind of things have come from them, the things that they want to see implemented. And as Roger said, um, as we look at effectively politicians now have a new audience that they need to um, to address these 16 to 17 year olds and I think um, I'm looking forward to seeing the way that politicians can engage with young people um, and discuss what it is that affects them um, and as Laura said with things like political education absolutely that is something I think we need to look at and I, I look forward um, to seeing um, Senate members work with uh, teachers and work with young people themselves which I think is key 
working with young people, not for young people, um, to see um, how we can implement these changes. And when it comes to political education, as Laura said, not necessarily about what we do on, on that Thursday going into to cast our ballot, but um, being able to empower young people to, to do their own research and, and figure out what is right for them. Um, so things like the importance of democracy and the importance of the vote that we've got and um, teaching young people the importance of actually going out on that Thursday and casting their vote. Um, the basics of, um, we live in a country party politics, the basics of that, and um, obviously there are challenges that arise with that in terms of how teachers can go about teaching it um, without any bias. Um, but giving young people the basic foundations of political education so that they can go out and make the decision for themselves. Um, what I think is very interesting as we, um, as we go forward and, and I think as we start coming to a bit more sense of normality where it's a lot easier for politicians especially to engage with young people, I think we will see a change in the type of policies um, that, that are implemented through governments. Um, as I said, because politicians now have a new audience that they need to uh, engage and they need to talk with. Um, through speaking with the young people that, um, that the aid is involved with, we're talking things like mental health provisions for young people. Um, climate change is something that really does worry young people and I think, um, I think that's something that will need to be um, addressed further as we go forward. Um, things like the access and the key thing is the continuity of youth services across Wales. Um, not, not just a chance to talk about funding for the year, but the, the chance that every young person in Wales has the equal opportunities, whether they're from a capital city or whether they're from a rural area uh, in Ceredigion or Gwynedd. Um, I think through the establishment of things like the Youth Assembly or the Youth Parliament of Wales, which I think is just a fantastic organisation. I, um, I love seeing what they do and I, um, I love working with uh, a lot of the young people who actually sit on it. It's, it's amazing to see the impact they've had um, and, and it's amazing to see that politicians, especially Welsh politicians, um, are listening to young people. Now, in fairness, through experience, the majority of Welsh uh, politicians that I've worked with um, generally do have an ear for young people. And um, I think I'm, I'm very grateful, actually, to um, Welsh Parliament members, because in general, the ones I've worked with have, have always been able to sit and talk with young people about what, what worries them and what issues they have. Um, so I think it's an amazing accomplishment for Wales and I think we should all be proud of. Um, but I also think that it's worth keeping in mind that um, with this comes a set of obligations that as young people, of course, we need to, we need to put the effort in as young people to, um, to make sure that we understand the importance of having this vote. Um, and I also think that, um, as Laura said, it's a great chance for us to, to continue to engage with young people um, to see what really, what, what issues are at heart with them and to see how we can implement uh, the changes uh, with them, not just for them. Brilliant, thank you so much, Ethan. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, we'll move now to President of Cardiff Student Union, Jackie Yip. Perfect, I was trying to unmute myself and realized the hosts have used me, so that, so thank you for doing that. Um, wow, uh, amazing speakers. I definitely feel like I've compounded imposter syndrome. I'm definitely not an expert in the political spheres, uh, but hopefully I can offer a short but sweet observation of, uh, from myself as a university student and, and represent some of the views I think that university students are feeling in the Cardiff demographic as well. Uh, so working on the name change, I think it's quite interesting. Um, I, I, I was born in England. My parents are from Hong Kong. So even growing up, the concept of parliament and the UK parliament was, my parents were very apolitical. So it was it, coming to Wales um, as an 18 year old studying, the, the concept of Welsh Assembly to me was quite alien. Uh, what do Welsh Assembly do? The concept of devolution uh, again was quite uh, interesting. So I think this name change now certainly for me reflects the parity um, that the Welsh government has with the UK and England and such um, and being on par together as well. And hopefully it's, it's for people like me coming over across the border, uh, those internationally and those from England as well, will we'll better understand the importance of the Welsh Government and Parliament and what devolution means and what it means, uh, especially in the context of this time. Um, so I think there's still a lot to be communicated. We've seen from this week, uh, I think as a prime example, when we have this talk now talking about COVID, for example, what has happened in England and what has happened in Wales. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in the union now trying to communicate to students, actually, this is why this is different here and this is why this is different over there. 
um, and I think we can also blame a lot of the UK media for, for allowing a lot of this confusion to happen. So I think this name change has been really significant uh, for the people of Wales and for those who currently reside in Wales. Um, and that I think even the process of uh, communicating the name change over the name itself has been really significant and outlined why it's important uh, and what it actually means during this time as well. Um, so I think that's a, a short but sweet understanding of what the name change uh, and what Welsh Parliament now means uh, for people and for students in uh, Wales. On to votes. This is what was something really exciting uh, for me. Um, I, I understand it's something that students unions and actually the National Union has, of Students, the NUS, have been campaigning for a, a quite a number of years. And so it's really great to see it finally pass and I'm extremely proud to be a representative in Wales uh, and be working in the student movement whilst this has happened. Um, because there's, so, like Ethan said, there are so many amazing things that 16 year olds can do at the moment. And even though I'm 24, I still perceive sometimes 16 year olds as quite young, but I certainly think that when I was 16, I thought I was invincible. I thought I knew it all. Um, I'm sure a lot of people can, can feel the same and they feel like they do understand things. And uh, I think allowing them to vote uh, allows to give them the option to explore things um, that they already feel that they kind of know and that they feel that they have a right to do anyway. Um, so it's really positive that they can do that. Um, and a lot of reflecting on what a lot of other people have said, it's really exciting to see them more engaged in politics as well. Um, so I think more now more than ever, we had the general election just last winter, it's, they're more connected more than ever as well. So their voice, I think, is going to really mean something in the future, um, for, the, for the next generation and in the future years as well. I think it's really fair to say that people obviously have reservations uh, about this, but I don't think we give, speaking as a, a hopefully still a young person, that we don't give them enough credit. Uh, for having the maturity and having these conversations? Um, is it because we don't allow them or is it because they are already having them but we're just not giving them the choice to do that? Um, because at the end of the day, it is entirely their future they're voting for, um, which is quite fascinating. I think they're the best informed that they ever have been to vote for that in, in that sense as well. That's why I also agree that it's wrong to sit that they're apathetic. Uh, when I was campaigning to be president, I was constantly battling with this idea that people wouldn't be interested in what I'm saying, they wouldn't believe what I'm saying, obviously on a very small scale in, in compared to uh, Welsh Parliament, UK Parliament, but battling this concept of apathy uh, was very different when I actually spoke to these individuals and actually go, actually, your policies do really resonate with me, or maybe I don't quite agree with that, I agree with someone else, but opening conversations in the first place, I think really transpires into what will happen to these 16, 17 year olds, where the first time actually, they may, you may be perceived as apathetic, but has anyone actually had a conversation with them or has anybody actually fully informed them about what could be happening, what their voice could actually mean um, for the future? Um, and I, I think I'm reflecting a lot of what other people have said. Maybe the policies will then change if we have these conversations, maybe more youth centric. Uh, I really like the point about uh, climate change. We've seen so much about this, uh, the, the climate protests, lots of things about Extinction Rebellion, which involves a lot of the youth population as well. And obviously we see the huge Greta Thunberg movements and David Attenborough, people are really passionate about this, uh, especially in school ages. And I don't think they, at the moment, uh, previously, did they had an outlet to express this or uh, people listened to what they felt was really important to them as well. So I think that's going to be a really positive change for 16, 17 year olds in that element as well. And to kind of see this kind of work in action, uh, we had the general election campaign last winter. We had 18 year olds in university voting for the first time and it really excited to vote. Uh, we did a huge student union campaign to get them to register, reminding them of the dates, reminding them where the nearest polling station is, reminding them what would happen if you're living in Wales and what would happen about your home addresses as well, all the tiny kind of logistical things as well. And that was really fun, uh, seeing how engaged students were, how excited students were. Um, we're nurturing the next generation. I could see that in um, when I was knocking on all the houses of these 18 year olds. Uh, they were dragging me in, telling, uh, trying to tell me to tell their housemates why they should go out to the police stations right now. Uh, people who said this is more important more now more than ever. Uh, so seeing that firsthand, I'm really excited to see what would happen. Hopefully 16 year olds won't be dragging strangers into their homes, but that concept of really wanting to engage on someone on their doorstep and say actually, why do you want me to go to this polling station? What are you selling to me? That's going to be really, really important for me. Um, so, and I think that's really important because previously I felt like we were denying students some of the most empowering experiences of their life. Uh, certainly looking at the, the young freshers in first year university going to the polling station for the first time, that was a real sign of their independence outside of the house, learning to cook and clean on their own for the first time. Hopefully 16 to 17 year olds will feel a little bit of that empowerment before they go on to the next journey of their life when they're officially adults at 18. 
Um, going back into kind of school ages then about political education in schools, from my own reflection, I definitely don't feel, I, I was a very hard worker, I must say, but I don't feel like I knew enough about politics uh, when I was learning it at GCSE, about even when I did history. Uh, we learned so much about uh, the suffragette movement, about empowering women to vote for the first time. Like I feel like it's ingrained in my uh, may, uh, mind, the Pankhurst, uh, the, the horse racing, how they died for us to vote. And you're sat there as a 14 year old going, and why do I have to wait till I'm this magical number of 18 to do something? So I think hopefully, like Ethan said, it's really great to make sure that students can vote 16 and 17, but it means nothing if we don't tell them uh, the processes from the early ages. Um, I'm not sure if people watch Question Time. I don't actually watch Question Time that often, but I sometimes go on as, a, as an extra timer with Adrian Charles, where we reflect on the communications and the uh, conversations that have been had in Question Time. And they said, no, we shouldn't be educating uh, secondary school children about politics because they're all Labour supporters. And then we'd be teaching children the wrong thing at school. And I thought that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure Ethan would, would agree with you on that one. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I certainly think, like I said in the beginning, uh, this, this movement is all about empowering uh, children and 16-year-olds and whoever with choice. Not telling them to vote a certain way, uh, not telling them not to vote for whatever, but giving them the right tools so they educate themselves and they learn the right ways um, that benefits them and what really matters to them to vote. Um, so denying them education is, I think, is is it's criminal. And, and I, I think that's a really good. I think that's a really good point, Jackie. <laughs> I think the reality of of going hand in hand allowing people to vote while also giving them an education um we have so many questions i'd love to yeah. ask you and the rest of the panel um just because we've we're running a bit late on time everyone's contributions have been fantastic thank you so much for that jackie that was absolutely brilliant um i'm just going to go through um some of the questions now and then we're going to pick ones that we can ask um emma and i are going to be asking the questions and it's for the whole panel to contribute to um so the first question that we had through um, from someone who's been watching is aside from this and the name change what do the panel think are other initiatives that should be considered in Wales to improve election turnouts so maybe Dawn if we could um, start with you or Roger or Laura or anyone I sorry I was just going to unmute myself I, I mean this this is a perennial question and I think it's it's a it's a question that all parliaments and all political parties have to address at, at all times and it's one of the things you know particularly from um, a Senate point of view we we don't have the turnout in Senate elections to the the same level as we do in general elections local government elections are even worse than Senate elections and so on so you know I, I think it comes back to the to the question of education about information uh, about raising awareness and and and, and the point about the, the earlier we can start talking to children in schools about the importance of government, and I'm talking about government at all levels, what it does, how it impacts and influences their lives, and, and, and why it's, it's necessary to, to, to go out and vote to, in order to, to influence and shape that then until we do that, I don't think we will see, we will see that change. I mean, one of the things that just that struck me um, was during the EU referendum, uh, and I think it's something that Laura uh, alluded to, but during the EU referendum, I was uh, speaking to a group of students at Merthyr College. So these are, these are the age group that will now come to vote at the uh, assembly election, the Senate elections, that, that age group. They couldn't vote in that EU election um, and they were some of the most informed groups that I spoke to during that referendum and tragically they didn't get a say in what was going to be happening in their future. Uh, and so the, the more we can do to, 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 to start that conversation at an early age and inform and educate, I think the better for everyone. Brilliant. I think one of the good, um, you know, it's hard to find good at the moment, isn't it? Because we're in one of the worst periods of our lives, you know, and, and worst period for many a generation. But, you know, one of the positives that's come out of this, I guess, is a greater visibility of our first minister, our health minister, our education minister. Um, and I'm pleased to say, you know, a little bit of flexing of muscles over the past um, few days in, in response to what I regard as pretty shoddy um, 
uh, collaboration between the governments of the UK. So I think in that sense, at least, the Welsh public is seeing that we have our own government, seeing that devolution is operating in practice, seeing that we can do things differently in terms of education, public health and so on. That's got to help a little bit. But, you know, uh, I'm not convinced that that will make si such a significant difference. I think there's a few things at play here, you know. Um, it, and Dawn will forgive me for saying this, but it hasn't helped that we've had um, the same party in power for the whole 21 years of devolution. This isn't a criticism of Welsh Labour because, you know, you should never criticise a party that wins elections. That's a sign of success. <laughs> you cri you criticise the other parties that haven't won elections. But we do have a weirdly skewed electoral system as well, which means that a party can effectively have most seats with, you know, less than a third of the popular vote. And that does create limited opportunities for forming alternative governments. So it's another argument in favour of electoral system change that would create a um, potential government to better reflect the way people have cast their votes. Um, and I think in turn that then encourages people to have more faith and, and support and legitimacy in the um, institution itself. But I think there are a couple of other things that I'd say from our expert panel work very briefly because I know you, you need to use the time effectively. Um, getting more diverse slates of candidates has an impact. We know that. Um, we recommended gender quotas built into the electoral system. We know that at the moment there are huge groups of the population, not least women and black and minority ethnic um, people who feel that politicians don't reflect them well. So I think if we can at least start with gender quotas, that encourages a greater diversity of candidates and so on. Um, and then, then in terms of getting candidates, things like job share, disappointed that that hasn't really had more traction um, so far. You know, I, I hope it will with the work that Dawn's doing, because I think the concept of job, job share is not just important for diversity. It's also important for professionals who want to come into politics for maybe a shorter time and then leave again. And I think that refreshes politics, too. So, you know, turnout is linked to the uh, vibrancy and vitality of politics as well. And the only way we freshen up politics is through more pluralism and more diversity, in my opinion. Can I just make uh, three brief points on this? Um, first is, I mean, there is one foolproof method to raise turnout very substantially, uh, and that is compulsory voting. Mm -hmm. Make voting a legal obligation and have people subject to a minor penalty if they don't fulfil that obligation. But both at the UK and devolved level, that doesn't seem to be on the serious agenda of, of just about any political party. Second point then is, if voting is going to remain uh, voluntary, um, uh, you know, Laura's at Line a number of the um, smaller things that can be done, I think, um, to, to help a little bit. Um, the biggest single thing, though, that will boost turnout in an election or other public vote is simply a public sense that this is something that matters, mm. um, that there is something really at stake and yeah. that depending on which side wins, that will really make a difference to their lives. Um, now, I think you know, doing that for devolved level politics is a long term, maybe a generational project. Um, but perhaps you know, the name change to the parliament will help just a little bit uh, at the fringes um, in, in raising people's sense of importance. My third and final quick point is simply that um, talking about turnout as, as our measure of health of democracy kind of, kind of assumes that we're still thinking about a way of democracy function in which the main role of the ordinary citizen is simply to be the voters, those who choose the representatives every few years. Um, I do think that in Wales, we're rather behind the international curve in terms of thinking about other ways in which people can be involved in the political process. And I don't hear I mean principally referendums. I think we in particular need to be looking in much more detail at uh, the recent Irish experience where ordinary citizens and things like citizens uh, assemblies, conventions, have been brought, brought in, in a very serious way into the political process, um, often on very major political issues, issues that the political system has struggled to deal with for years. Um, and at the moment, our discussion in Wales on that, I think, is, is quite a long way behind where uh, at least a number of our international friends um, are, are on that. Brilliant. Um, I think we don't have a ton of time left. I was wondering if we could hop to um, Emma for, um, she's kind of, we've kind of accumulated a lot, we've got a lot of questions on the media and scrutiny and what this could mean for that. So if we could go to Emma, our PAC Vice Chair for um, our one big final question. 
Yeah, okay, so <laughs> there's gonna be quite a lot to try and get into this, but um, it's, a, it's obviously a big and important uh, sort of subject. I mean, uh, earlier, obviously, we talked um, a little bit about how COVID um, had, uh, had a massive impact in, in the media and, and with devolution. So would the panel members just like to sort of reflect on, you know, what we call our dem democratic media deficit, um, you know, sort of the understanding even across the border of uh, sort of between English and Welsh politics and, you know, even some of those uh, institutions that we have, you know, someone's raised a point uh, that we have an England, England and Wales ONS. Um, you know, we've still got, I suppose, this is a bit of a cheeky one as a sideline, we've still got the justice issue. So that's a lot of different elements to try and get into. But the, the main one, I think, around media, if we can uh, just have some closing thoughts on that. Do you want me to start again? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, as a politician, um, I, I, I just despair of our media um, because one, you know, one, one of the difficulties that you that you have as a politician, and I'm not talking about you know party polit politics now, is actually just getting your message across and having it reported properly and effectively. Uh, so that that's just a that's just a problem of of, of politics um, per se. But this COVID crisis, I think, has brought into stark focus the way in which our media has um, singularly failed to report correctly how devolution works and even acknowledge. That it works, and I think Laura touched on it in in, in her in, in her uh, presentation at the beginning. This has really made people sit up and realise for the first time in 20 years we're not actually doing anything different to what we've been doing for 20 years in terms of health policy and and so on. But for the but for the first time, um, we've seen we've seen a convergence of uh, different approaches and the, the media having to report it. And I think that came, that came, very, came very clear over this weekend when we saw the, uh, the UK Prime Minister making announcements that applied only to England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland were saying, well, hang on a minute, that isn't, that isn't what's happening here. Now, I, I, when I first came into the Assembly, I sat on the uh, Culture, Welsh Language and Communications Committee. And one of the things that we were looking at then was was how Welsh life is depicted in the media. And I'm not just talking about on news, but across the whole of media. And, and news broadcasting was one of the key elements that, you know, we have the, the, the big news programmes, the six o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news on ITV and on BBC, and they always lead with uh, UK government issues. And those, over the years, those UK government uh, issues that they lead on have have by and large not been uh, Welsh issues. So we had things like the junior doctor strike. We didn't have a junior doctor strike in Wales. We had a negotiated settlement in Wales with the junior doctors. But every night on the 10 o'clock news, it was a junior doctor strike, junior doctor strike. And, and you know, it, it, in, terms of, in terms of addressing that, um, I, I think the, the BBC, the IT, ITV, Sky Channels, they, they all have a major part to play now in working out how they are going to properly reflect life as it is governed across four different nations and that hasn't worked so far but I think this COVID crisis might actually bring that into focus and might make those those people responsible for our media focus on that more effectively because without that we, we end up with our citizens being confused and you know and I'm sure I'm not the only MS that has got a, an inbox full of people asking questions about why they're not going back to work to the, this week when Boris Johnson said we can and so on and so forth so um, yeah so that would be my take on it is just that the the the, the proprietors the people that, that run our media media outlets whether it's newspapers whether it's tv or whatever really have to start reporting the way in which this country is governed more effectively brilliant i wonder um laura do you have any um final comments kind of in response to that question and then we'll go to jackie and ethan um before finishing up uh 
Um, I think you might be muted, Laura. Sorry. Yes, I was. Yeah, I was waiting for somebody to unmute me. Yeah, um, just just very quickly. I mean, I don't buy this thing that you get the media you deserve because I think that the lack of a serious media in Wales is a long historic problem. Um, but I do think you you can change. Uh, to get a better media if the media flex their muscles a little bit and in fairness you know I think that's happened over the past few days and and that's good um, I think that today's front page of the Western Mail is pretty horrific mind I don't know how many people have seen it um, a classic case of of you know manipulating a policy in a pretty dangerous way in my opinion but but you know the reality the reality is we we as citizens need to demand more as well we need to um, not accept the fact that the UK media um, either ignores Wales completely or when it does gets things wrong as they have done over the past few days because in a crisis like this obviously communication is absolutely critical and uh, shortfalls of communication are a matter of you know human safety so it couldn't be more fundamental than at the moment but i think you know we've we've all got to demand better basically you know and, and urge our public leaders to do something at least to improve the quality and the profile of how wales is represented not just beyond wales but actually to ourselves because part of our kind of crippling lack of self-confidence comes from the fact that we get very little positive portrayal of Wales um, politically or otherwise in our national media and that's quite a scandal in my opinion. Um, Jackie do you have any final thoughts? Yeah only that it, it really resonates me, with me on a personal level. Um, I set myself as an example because I have a twin sister currently living in England under very different lockdown rules and what she perceives as a new normal for her in England is very different from what I'm experiencing in Wales here and that is further by the issues we see in the media. She my family in England therefore do not comprehend the differences that I'm experiencing here and what my students are here and why I've, I've chosen to remain here as well. Um, so I definitely feel the reflections publicly and what people are reading can be quite toxic in terms of understanding people's different situations and understanding the full context of the severity of this as well. Short but sweet. Oh, thank you. Um, can we go to Roger and then Ethan? Mm. I'll just... Very briefly. Yeah, it's been missing and rather scary in, I think, recent weeks to realise the extent to which many senior political journalists and also political figures who really ought to know this stuff would apparently fail a sort of British politics 101 course, or at least the, the devolution bit of it. Um, <coughs> but I, my second point is that I think one detects not really at all beneath the surface in, in quite a few comments there's not only substantial ignorance about devolution, both within and outside Wales, there's also still significant hostility um, and contempt um, for the devolved level institutions uh, amongst, amongst um, at least... Uh, at least some London. Um, and I think, you know, one of the implications of this whole crisis might not just be Kind of the more optimistic suggestions of, of Donald Law that this might help people demand more and expect better of their media. It might also energise, frankly, some of those for whom the very existence of a devolved level of Welsh, you know, a devolved Welsh Parliament, a devolved Welsh Government is something that is, um, you know, something they, they still view with, with both contempt and hostility. Thank you. Ethan, if we could get your final thoughts as well on that. Yeah, I think um, I think what's been said, I think everyone's just, just nailed it really in terms of what's been said. I think it's, um, I think it's evident, obviously, um, I, I kind of said at the start, I'm a very proud Welshman, but I currently live in Portsmouth, which means I'm kind of the... I'm the Welsh guy within my um, my group of friends. And, it, and it's always interesting to me just under, you're speaking to... Um, who, who all of my friends are English and speaking to them about how they see Wales and um, the the lack of knowledge is outstanding. My my best friend, is, as much as I love him, he he doesn't know the name of the Welsh minister. He even says to me once, um, he said, "Oh, what what currency do you use in Wales?" And and it's that kind of um, that I think I think it's scary that when you look at um, when you look at what's on the news generally, the on a lucky day, the only thing we we see about Wales is Hugh Edwards. And that, and that is the extent of what we see um, about Wales on mainstream UK media. And I think it's, um, don't get me wrong, as much as I love seeing um, a Welshman at the helm, um, 
it, it, it's scary when you see that um, there's that lack of understanding. Um, and, I, and I do think, sorry, I know you're eager to wrap up, so I'll wrap up really quickly. I think it, it, it goes beyond that and shows just, just how um, Wales in particular has evolved um, administration. Um, I think it just shows how we are viewed in, in the UK media. And I think um, until we can really, yeah, sorry to just echo points that have been said, but until we can really stand up as, um, as a Welsh parliament and as a Welsh nation, not as a principality and not as um, a lesser um, a lesser administration of, of the UK, until we can really stand up for that, um, we, we'll see a real uh, impact in the way that the UK as a whole sees Welsh politics and sees the role that Wales plays um, in, in the wider sense. So, um, yeah, I think what, what was said by everyone else was just uh, perfect, really. Oh, brilliant. Well, I think we could carry on talking about this subject for absolute hours. Yeah. But I, really, I really respect that everyone here has a really packed schedule, so I'm trying my absolute best to keep it short. So we're going we're gonna to have to close now. However, we got so many questions that we're going to have to do. Um, we're going to have to try answer them in a follow-up email and blog. Um, we're going to try accumulate everything that we kind of talked about today in a blog and make sure that we share that on the PAC website. Um, I just want to say such a big thank you to all the panel. You guys have all been absolutely fantastic i know you are all so so busy so we really appreciate you taking the time i also want to say a big thank you um, to grayling for helping us by partnering on this event um, and then i think it's also really important to thank all the people who work um, really hard to make this kind of thing happen so i just want to say a big thank you to ellen jones emma henwood um, polly Wynn, and ben coates who've all worked really hard to um and they're all on the pack committee and they've all worked really hard to make this event happen so thanks everyone and have a have a wonderful Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.